chapter number 2, just for a minute tonight. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. I'd like to read a verse of scripture here this evening. Uh, I've been asked about this for years and years. I never preached a camp meeting about every five years. And, uh, and I, I do that, as I said, every four or five years. We have so many visitors here, and they fuss at me if I don't. And other people fuss at me if I do. Uh, so I try to just do what the Lord had me to do. And I've been asked and asked and asked about this. And I did it like 20, 21 years ago. So tonight... We'll look at this scripture again this evening. Brother Frankie had the absolute right message preparing uh, for this message tonight. For the preachers especially. It's for everybody, but especially for preachers. One thing about a real preacher, he has a heart for other preachers. He knows what it's like. And I appreciate that, Brother Frankie. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul, to the young preacher, he wrote this to a young preacher. Thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I'm preaching tonight on the subject, the Pony Express. The message that basically says, don't quit. Don't quit because you're tired. Don't quit when you're bleeding. Don't quit when you're hurting. Don't quit when you're knocked down. Don't quit when you're discouraged. Don't quit when you're scared. Don't quit when you're sick. Don't quit when you want to quit. Just don't quit. The devil can't do nothing with somebody that will not quit. The devil loves quitters. And quitters never win. And, you know, winners never quit. So tonight, uh, to do this, I want to illustrate this message. And I'd like to, for you to just go back in your mind tonight and in your memory, back years ago, over 160 years ago in, the, in America, things were not like they are now. There was no telephone. There was no telegraph. There was no television. There was no phone, Internet. There was no way for people in one part of the world to even know what was going on in the other part of the world. And it was an exciting time. Uh, and there's three men named Russell, Majors, and Waddell got together and they come up with this idea. They said, we can figure out how to get the mail from over here on this side of America to that side of America. They took from St. Joseph, Missouri, here to begin with, because it was connected with New York, and they wanted to get the word to California because there was gold in California. And at this time, there was a half a million people living in California mining for gold. Now, all these gold miners had left their family back home and they didn't have no way to get in touch with each other, had no way of knowing. And at that time, the only way they could tell them something was by stagecoach. And it would take minimum of one month or most of the time, even two. So somebody come up with this idea of what we call the Pony Express. And the Pony Express was basically... Uh, they got a bunch of dashing, daring young men that were ready to do something for the Lord uh, and of their country, and they gave them these ponies. And they would ride this pony uh, over here and take the mail and ride this pony, and then there'd be what they called a relay station because that pony can only run about 20 miles before they just run, I mean, just wore out. From here, the other side of Hickory down here, or, or same from here, Marion. And then that Pony Express rider would drop off that pony, hop on another one, and just keep going. And they had relay stations along the way, 190 relay stations. It's 2,500 miles. So ever so many miles, they had a, what they called a relay station where the, the rider himself would stop off and take a break and let somebody else carry it. And they finally got that thing, the fastest the mail ever got from Missouri to Sacramento, California, was 11 days. And that was when President Lincoln 
won that election in 1960. And that was an amazing, amazing feat. People could not believe it. There were daring young riders who delivered the mail. And uh, the Pony Express only lasted 18 months because somebody had been telegraphed and it wasn't needed anymore. But oh my, at the stories. They, they didn't go the stage co- route, uh, stagecoach route. They went by the, uh, the down into the uh, Platte River across Nebraska. That was the old Oregon Trail south of Salt Lake, Utah, Sierra, uh, Sierra Nevada Mountains, and then down into California. All the old Westerns talk about this time. Uh, actually, there was an episode of Bonanza uh, that made it. Little Joe actually it would become a Pony Express rider. You, you can still see that old Bonanza. And little Joe, boy, he got down there. He got on that pony boy, and I'm telling you, he got loaded up. He took up down through there. I think they speeded up the film a little bit. 90 miles an hour. Down. That little pony just a flying down through yonder. And he'd take, he'd take that mail and deliver it. Now, you know the thought I'm getting at tonight, and I will talk about us as God's preachers and all God's people. We have a job to do, and that is deliver the mail and so that they have good news from a far country. My job and your job is to deliver the mail. You know what the mail is. It's this book right here. It is our job to take it and and, and, uh, leave the mail. Now, I've got some stuff with me tonight to illustrate this. And the first thing I want to show you is when they started this, they actually had this printed up. I got this shirt when I was preaching in Texas. Come on here and help me, Paisley. And uh, uh, I, I got this shirt when I was preaching in Texas. And this is what they uh, this is what they uh, nailed up on telephone poles down at the bar, at the barber shop, and the places in town. And it said this. That, that, that's a perfect, uh, absolute replica of what they nailed up. Remember these in the days of the Old West. All I'm talking about Matt Dillon, Clint Eastwood. I, I mean, uh, I, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, Duke. What's his name? Yeah, John Wayne. Uh, all them guys back in them days, and all them, uh, uh, all them stories that they made. And so what they did was, this is what it said. This was sponsored by Smith and Wesson. Supreme quality for extreme situations. 1852. And it says, Pony Express, riders want it. Effective July the 1st, 1861. Young, skinny, wiry fellows. They wanted young, skinny, wiry fellows. I ain't young no more, but I can be skinny and wiry. But that's what they wanted. You know why? Because they had to ride them ponies a long way. And look here what it says. Anxious for adventure and a chance to see the great west, the wild blue, wild blue yonder, must be expert riders willing to risk death daily. God called you to preach? You got to be willing to give it all and risk death daily. And he said this. Orphans preferred. Now, why did he say that? Because there's a good possibility they're going to get killed. And that way, I mean, if Orvin got killed, wasn't that big a deal? He didn't have no family. You know, but uh, so he didn't want to break some boy's mama's heart. Uh, and so they preferred ortho, orphan. Now, while I get ready, I want you to start right over there and go real slow and go across here and show them this. This is my granddaughter here, so she, you know, she's experienced in this type of ministry. And uh, I'm going to get this ready. Uh, DJ, come here just a second. And just come on across here real slow so they can see. I want everything off this table right here, except for them, them two. The, except for them two, the first thing you grab. I, every time I look at that thing, I think of this guy I seen one time. Uh, I, 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 let's get them out. Come on. All right. You go real slow so they can see it. And uh, uh, she, uh, they, they had this thing put up all over town. And they, they put these things up over town. And all these young boys would go to town and they would see that. And when they'd see that, they looked at that and they said, man. That's good. I want to be a Pony Express rider. I want to be a Pony Express rider. And that right there is what they put all over town. Thank you very much, Sister Paisley. And uh, I, I want to show you that tonight. And so I will talk about three things quickly here this evening. Number one, yeah, let me hang that up here so they can look at it during this sermon tonight. All right, let's hang that right here. How's that? Won't it? Young, skinny, 
I don't see many Pony Express riders in here tonight. <laughs> Wiry fellers. Number one, I'm going to talk about the demands on the rider. The demands on the rider. They had certain things. They wouldn't just let anybody be a Pony Express rider. Just anybody come around and say, I want to be. Nope, nope. You had to meet certain demands that they put on the rider. Number one, of course, they had to be little men. Little men. 130 pounds maximum. What? Wait, 28 inch waist. I am, I am uh, 20 pounds too heavy right now to be a Pony Express rider. 130 pounds. Uh, now I'm not talking about I'm not talking about uh, our, our physical physical bodies tonight. I'm just saying that's what they had to be to do be a Pony Express rider. They had to be little men. Amen. This evening, I'm gonna tell you tonight. You better learn what that preacher said there a minute ago. You better learn how to stay little, boys. You get your head stuck up there too high, somebody will knock it off. Yeah, the last thing in the world this generation needs is a bunch of preachers strutting around like peacocks, acting like they're God's gift to the world. Uh, whenever, when the truth is, half of them wouldn't even go to church if they wasn't a preacher. And I'm going to tell you tonight, brother, listen, you hear me? They had to be little men. There is no place for pride in the ministry. I, there's no place for it. I've seen them walk in like this and walk in like, and look around. And want to be, and they get mad if you don't recognize them or call them to pray. I, I know, Lord, have mercy. I know preachers. That I I have sat and listened to preachers talk, and I thought, Lord, there ain't no wonder God don't get nothing done. They're sitting and talking, said, I ain't going there no more. They don't give me enough offering. I ain't going back to that church. They ain't never nobody there. I'm not going there to that church. I, and they, they they don't put me in a nice little motel. And I thought, Lord, you don't even need to be preaching. I, listen, if I ever called a preacher to preach here and he said well preacher I'll come but I gotta have a minute I'd say well I, you pray about it buddy I'll never call you again All right, listen I, they had to have little men little men you had to be little to be a pony express ride and I, I'm talking about how they were little they didn't, they didn't have all that weight on that poor little old pony and the Bible said for me and you to lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily be set up. Let me tell you young preachers here, God ain't going to use you if you carry around a bunch of sin in your heart. I don't care how nice you look on the outside. If you got a bunch of wickedness in your heart and you got a bunch of sin in you, God ain't going to use you to be a writer. you got to be little men. God uses little men. God uses little men like Wild Bill Hickok he, uh, and Wild Bill Cody were actual Pony Express riders. Them little boys stood in line. There were only 200 actual Pony Express riders chosen that could do it. God could use you if you're not full of yourself. God don't use big shots. You're not a big shot. You're a little shot that ought to be shot. You're not, you're not hot snot. You're a cold booger. And the truth is tonight, it's only by the grace of God that he'd touch any of us here tonight. Night, and I'm telling you, God wants little men. Don't go around sticking your head up like you learned ever. Know everything, know everybody. Listen, brother, you've been half. God gave you what you deserve. Young, skinny, wiry fellers. Wait a second, West Virginia feller. And uh, I'm going to tell you, you know what they said about them? Said they could not drink alcohol. A Pony Express rider could not drink alcohol. It's sad that the United States government had more sta higher standards than a lot of churches do for preachers. Lord, in them mega churches, they go out and have a beer after service. And the preacher and all them sit there to ride that pony for a brother. You had, you had, you couldn't drink alcohol. You know what else is said? They can't use profanity. They couldn't cuss. That cuts out some preachers I've seen. Hey, they couldn't cuss. If you cussed, you could not be a, well, preacher, you just don't understand. I get mad and I let one fly. Well, you know why cuss comes out your mouth? Because cuss is down in your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Whatever's in your heart comes out your mouth. And the reason you got dirty stuff coming out of your mouth called dirty stuff's in your heart. And brother, they could not. I guess they figured if a man will cuss, he'll cheat us on some other side of the deal. So they could not cuss. They could not drink. They had to say, had to have a moral life and had to be honest, faithful to their duties and their motto was neither rain nor snow, neither death nor life will keep us from our duty. And so the most important thing quickly tonight was the mail. 
Now, I'm going to use this here tonight as the mail. This will be my mail pouch. That was the most important thing. That's that King James Bible. The most important thing was the mail. The no most important thing is not the man. The most important thing ain't you. The most important thing ain't me. The most important thing is not your ministry. I know people get all wrapped up. Well, what would that do to my ministry? If I do that, it might hurt my ministry. I tell you what you better do. You better deliver the mail Amen. like you're called to do. Quit trying to advance yourself. Quit trying to go to other churches and show up so maybe they'll notice you and ask you to pray. Go, go, go gag somebody, man. All right, you get up in the woods and get the sin out of your life and get a hold of God. Get a message from God. He'll open a door for you to preach. You know why God don't open no door? You ain't got nothing to say. So he's got this mail bag here and this little horse here. He said, this is the most important thing. You do whatever you got to do, but this mail has got to go through. You thought I was going to say the man. Secondly, the most, second most important thing was the horse. See, I don't care how good you was. You ain't going nowhere without a horse. Now they chose 200 horses and a good horse in 1860 was $50 cause gold was $16 an ounce. You buy land for 75 cents an acre in some in places. So the, a good horse for $50, they paid $200 for those Pony Express horses. And they put that mail, this, this, is going to be my little horse here tonight. And they took him out and they set him out. And they said, take the mail, boy. Take that mail. So the horse, the mail, that's, that's the picture of the church. They went from one church to another church to another church to another church like evangelists, like preachers, like missionaries, and took the mail to Sacramento, California, and they read the letter, everything's all right back home. I got a good news from a far country. That is mine and your job as a preacher. We are to take the mail. Take the mail. It was a horse. Then finally, the third thing was the rider. Amen? It was a rider. He had, I gave him three things. Now, they gave him three things besides the horse. They gave him a bottle of water. I had one here a while ago. Did I leave it laying over? They gave him the mail. They gave him a bottle of water. This would be like a canteen. And they put it on there. And they gave him one more thing, two more things. They gave him a pistol, a 44 pistol. Now, this is my daddy's, and so I'm going to use it tonight to be a Pony Express, Express rider. And so this is what they gave him, little boys. They gave him a pistol, a 44, and they gave him, he was ready to go. Now, this is not, a, it's not loaded, but there are some in here that is, Amen. just in case anybody gets any ideas. You say, now, Lord, have mercy. You went to church pre Friday, Saturday night and preached a pull a gun on it. Well, you know, what you had to do? They put them things on there like that, and they said, all right. All right, you got, your, you got the mail. You got your pistol. And they, they, got, they, got, they, they got their hat. They got ready to go. They got, and I'll sing a country song if you mess with me. And they settled him up. And you know what else they give him? Let me see Bible mentor, Chris. They gave him a special, uh, don't take pictures. <laughs> they gave him a special edition copy of a King James Bible. That's a fact. That's a fact. You can look it up on the internet. They gave them boys a King James Bible. Isn't that odd? Isn't that strange? They said, all right now, buddy, you got your mail, you got your water, you got your Bible. Now get on that thing. Boy, they'd hop on that. And they'd hop on that little pony. He, he's, his head don't look all that good. But he's going to be here. And buddy will say, all right, you ready? I'm going 75 miles. All right, let's go. And so they took off down the road. It's, 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 it's just like going to a chiropractor. That's right. It was a chiropractic adjustment for free. It's many people. I'm not a great horse rider. I never have been. But anyway, down the road they went, son. 
And I'll never forget that night when I was 19 years old. I got saved when I was 18. But when I was 19, somebody showed me one of them things. I heard Ed McAbee preach like that. And I said, sign me up. I want to be in the Lord's army. I want to be a Pony Express rider. I want to ride. And through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. But by the grace of God, I'm riding my pony tonight. I got always have all these many years. Hey, Amen. I thank God that I get to ride for the Lord. Now, you know what they told him, boy? They said, you can't use that gun for your own profit, for your own benefit. The only time you're allowed to use that gun is protect the male. Not to shoot the other Pony Express rider that they disagreed with on some. Like we do. Not to shoot brother so-and-so because they didn't like his boots. Or he didn't have on the right kind of hat. Or his saddle wasn't looked so right. No, they said the only reason you can use that gun is protect that male. I'm telling you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, all that me and you can do is to give everything we've got, preachers, to protect the male. That You're not the important thing the male is. I'm not the important thing the male is. Let me tell you some people, this book right here is the most important thing in the whole blessed world. Amen. Amen. The demands on the rider. Number two, we see the danger of the ride. The danger of the ride. It wasn't all fun and games. It was dangerous. Do you realize tonight there was lions and tigers and rattlesnakes, engines. There's engines out there. And they didn't like them little boys come riding through their claimed territory. And they scalped them. Miraculously, there was only two times that the male did not make it through. Other than that, 650,000 times, miles, with bears and wolves and mountain lions, the male made it to Sacramento. Them little boys rode through cold. They rode through heat. See, you talking about a while ago? Now, look, I've been there, brother. I had a little house. When that one right there, Carrie, sitting over there tonight, was about two years old. And we lived in a little house where the wind, literally, when the wind blowed, the curtains would come out, like that right there. And when I first started preaching, we hung, we hung a blanket over the kitchen door. So that little oil, Siegler oil heater would put uh, heat into the living room and the bedroom where she was asleep. And I remember getting up, and it's 18 degrees, and the pipes all froze, and it busted. And I remember thinking, Lord, I mean, I just started preaching. I was 20 years old. And I've been preaching revival since I was 19. And I had to preach in Charlotte. And I went out and I had an old van that wouldn't start. And I didn't have enough gas. And them pipes underneath that house were busted. And I left it like that and I said, I'll be back after a while. And we got a man come over and he took a little blowtorch, climbed up under the house, started trying to thaw them out. But it's 20 degrees. I mean, time you got one of them thawed, it'd freeze somewhere else. And I remember going to that old van, and that van wouldn't start. And I pushed as hard as I could and pushed. I got it going down the driveway, jumped in, put it in second gear, and jumped it off. And I borrowed $3 from my cousin to get to come down to Charlotte and preach that night. And I remember that. Now all I could think about is, God wants me to take the mail. God wants me to take the mail. I tell you what this young generation of preachers don't have. Stuff like that right there. Yes, sir. They walk around in nice suits. They live in nice cars. They have leather seats in there. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But I'm telling you people, that ain't the ministry. The ministry. Brother John Wesley rode a horse over 100,000, 93,000 miles, something like that, and preached three and four times a day, had his horse shot at, had himself shot at, and delivered that mail. The dangers of the ride. You see, they'd take off out through there, and one day it'd be beautiful. One day the sky was blue, the sun was warm. And Lord, the wild blue yonder, breathing that fresh air, looking over the Nebraska and the Sierra, Sierra Nevada, all over the mountains. Oh, boy, it's wonderful. I'm delivering the mail. They'd come into one of them uh, exchange stations, about every 15 miles, get a fresh horse, jump on that thing, keep going. 
All the, the little girls in the town were in love with a dashing young Pony Express rider. And it was, oh, oh, and he kept going, kept going. But it wasn't always like that. Sometimes he had to sleep up against his horse, keep his freezing to death. They rattlesnakes were not. Build a fire. The only thing I can't stand, it's preachers. I've had it. I've seen it. When they go somewhere to preach, have to have a certain type of motel or they won't even stay. You are disqualified to be a writer for God. No, don't get me wrong. Uh, we treat preachers good here. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being good to the man of God, taking care of if a church can. But if they can't, and if he's out in a mission field somewhere, you know what you do? You just keep going anyway through endure hardness. Endure hardness. I've heard preachers say, said, boy, they put me in that dump. I'm going to go find me another place. I'll tell you what you need to do, Sonny. You need to go back in the nursery. You don't know what hard times are. You've heard me tell it. Listen, I, I was preaching. When I first got saved, I went to Sammy Allen's camp meeting down in Resaca, Georgia, and Ed McAbee and all them was there and they was all preaching. And I said, Brother Ed, right in there with everybody else. No better than nobody else. Preacher ain't no better than nobody else. And a preacher ought to work with his hands. A preacher that's got soft hands, there's something wrong with him. He needs to dig a ditch, move some cross ties, get a hold of a, a rake and a hoe and a shovel, and plant a garden. Now, man, he needs to be endure some hardness. And Ed said this. He said, when you go somewhere to preach, you take whatever they give you or don't give you and keep your mouth shut and keep going. And I never forgot that. You've heard me tell. I, was in, I went to Tennessee to preach a youth camp, and I was probably 20-something 20, 20 years old, and I went there, and... And they said, now, Brother Danny, you're going to stay right here in this trailer. Everybody else has to stay in the dorm. You get special treatment. I said, cool. It looked like a little trailer about alone here, that wall. It looked like a bullet, like them that Ricky and Lucy lived in, them, them silver ones, you know. It looked like a bullet. I said, that's fine with me, man. This is nice. And it was 100, 100 degrees, middle of July in Chattanooga. And I remember going in there, and I thought, well, you know, it was tiny. I mean, you, you walked, and the whole thing moved I can't had a little bed there that bathroom Lord have mercy I don't know who they made them things for little door about that but you had you had to look where you and just back in there and sit down aim hope you aimed right and, and flop down you had to be a pony express rider to get in there I think it made them things them things that ride around in them UFOs and and brother they they they, they the guy got in there, and I got in there and I did real good first day Next day, I laid down. Brother Frank, I felt something crawling up me. It's a tick. I said, oh, God, get that stupid tick off me. I hate ticks. And I threw it at the floor. Then a minute, I felt another one. And it's in my bed. And I could hear Ed and them saying, don't complain. Don't complain. I said, all right, I ain't complaining. I'll, I'll find them. I'll get them out of here. And I threw three or four in there. I mean, I was, by the time it got dark, I thought, Lord in mercy. I'll tell you what I did. I stuck my fingers and my thumbs in my ear and my fingers in my nose so that I didn't want them crawling in my nose and hatching out in there and going in my brain and driving me crazy. I thought, if them ticks get in my head, I'll go crazy. So I got like this and like this, and I balled up in a fetal position like that, and I slept. I don't think I ever even told them about it. Brother Danny, that's ridiculous. Them boys had to do it. Them boys had to do it. We ain't no better. Listen, people, our brethren in other countries in Sudan, they don't even have a place to lay their head. We are a bunch of spoiled, rot brats in the ministry today. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves having to be treated like royalty. Amen. Amen. One of them guys lied about his age. He's only 16. He's supposed to be a little, I think he had to be 17, be one. And, and he, he, he lied, and he's 16, but they let him run. That little boy took off on that pony, and the story said that he went down through there, and he rode, 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 and all of a sudden, seven Indians come out of nowhere and surrounded him, going around, whoo! You know, they'll circle around, and he was out there on that little pony. And all he was scared, and they ambushed him. They killed him. And the next day, they came out there, and there's. They, there's that little boy laying in the dust. And he had his arms right there, and that male like that right there. Just like Lester Roloff did 
when his plane went down. Just like. And he's laying there dead. And there's seven dead Indians laying around him. And he said, buddy, you might get me, but I ain't going down without a fight. I'll fight, brother, till you kill me. I'll fight, brother, till the light goes out. I'll fight till you cut my head off. There ain't no quit in us. There ain't no quit. Hey, if you quit just because your wife fusses at you or something like that, you'll never make it. I can tell you that right now. But you better develop something down in here like some guts, brother, and some determination to say, I ain't quitting. It don't matter what happens. Man come to me, Frankie, he said, uh, he said, now wait a minute, you said that boy killed seven Indians. He didn't have a six shots in his gun. I said, well, he was good. He waited until two of them got in the road, shot two at the same time. I don't know. Maybe he took his knife, I don't know. That's what the story said. Lester Roloff went down with a mail clenched. David Livingston in South Africa, away from his wife for three years. You didn't just come home every six months. Missionary didn't back in them days. And I hate that happened for him and her. And he left it. And he's, I, know, I know preachers' wives right now, if he preaches three revivals, she said, I'm leaving him. He's gone too much. I have needs. He won't meet my needs. David Livingston in Africa, three years. Was he out of the will of God? No. And when he saw his wife, he hugged her. And she said, darling, I'm, a, I'm afraid to tell you the bad news for the joy that I have of seeing your face. David Livingston went back to Africa and stayed there till he died. And they cut his heart out, shipped it back to Glasgow, buried his body in Africa. An African lion come out of the jungle, nearly tore his arm off, and his arm was like this, so he had to start shooting his gun left-handed. He couldn't even move his left arm. Back in them days, preachers said, I'm in this thing for God. I'm in this thing for good. It don't matter if they like it, if they don't like it. If they help me, if they don't help me, if they cuss me, if they shout, if they leave, they stay, no matter what, the danger of the ride, brother. I'm telling you people, I have been, I was in Germany one time, and I was in Germany, and a missionary, they took off somewhere, and I got the flu. I got the flu so bad, I couldn't get out of bed. I mean, and I don't never get sick like that no more. But that was, Lord, that was probably 30, 35 years ago. And I got the flu so bad. And they said, well, you don't have to stay up here with these people. They put me in a house up there. And I could not understand one word them people said. They couldn't understand me. They went off to work. And I was laying covered up, shivering with a fever in Germany. And I was saying, where's Hoppy Tom? God, what am I doing here? I, I'd have given thirty dollars for a bottle of Pepto Bismol. I'm sick as a dog, throwing up everything. You know what? So I just said, deliver the mail, deliver the mail, deliver the mail, deliver the mail, deliver the mail. We've had bomb threats. I've had my own life threatened many times. I've had my brake line cut. Guy sneaked up my house one night. He, he hated me. Undone the brake line of my car. Try to get me killed. I took, to, I took it to a mechanic. I said, man, I ain't got no brakes. He said, you got somebody that don't like you? I said, yeah, I do. He said, they snuck under your car and cut your brake lines loose. That's all in the ride. They are not going to celebrate you everywhere you go. They never have. They never will. I've, I've, we had rock music preaching against rock music. And the next day, come in, the whole churchyard was covered with pieces of paper that big. said, Mick Jagger is God. Looked like snow in the, church, in the church driveway, in the yard. I had my name spray painted on the, on the spillway over there. Um, you know, and, and sometimes it's like that. Sometimes it's out there like this, and you hear a rattlesnake or a, or a lion in the distance, and you're freezing, and you're up against your horse, and you're saying, I don't know if I'm ever going to make it. Then the next day, the sky clears up. And brother, the line is beautiful, and you head down the road on that pony. That's the way the ministry is. Sometimes they're shouting. Sometimes they people get. Listen, I've seen it so hot. I, I did the Lord's Supper one night and had three or four people got saved. I, I'm telling you, it's like it's falling fruit out of a tree, getting saved right and left. And then I've seen it so dry and dusty. You had to prime a man before he could spit, like Billy Sunday said. And I'm telling you, this evening, people, it, you go through the hard time. It ain't always fun. Some Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's wonderful. Tell you what I've done. 
I drove, somebody had a church down yonder in South Carolina, almost Myrtle Beach. And they said, you need to get this guy down there and let him preach to you. Young people about music. They said, okay, send him on. I didn't know them, they didn't know me. I drove 250 miles one way. I walked in there that night, set up my stuff. That's when I was using slides. Lord, I doubt I called them rock musicians, everything. So it wasn't bad enough. I couldn't say it. And I'm telling you, I said, they're wicked. They're the devil, you know. And I noticed that crowd was kind of quiet. I got through that night, and buddy, the whole youth group crowded around me, and the youth director, some, some woman they had as youth director, pointed her finger at me and said, you don't have no right talking about people and judging people. And I just stood there like this, rubbing my pony through this place. This is almost 300 miles. And the preacher didn't even speak to me. The preacher took off out the door and didn't speak one word to me. You say, what'd you do? I loaded up my stuff, got back on my pony, and rode 250 miles back. 500 miles, and I got cussed out. Yeah, it didn't really bother me. I thought, I ain't got no more sense than that. I, I don't pay no attention to people that dumb. Somebody take up for rock music ain't got a whole lot of sense. And I, and I, and I rode my, my pony back. But see, it ain't always like that. The next week, I sat down on a big airplane and flew to Rochester, New York, and got off the plane. The preacher met me there, and he said, good to have you, Brother Castle. Here's $100 you can eat on the next couple of days. And they put me in a, Lord in mercy, it's ridiculous. Big old motel room. I had like three rooms, living room. What well, do you need a living room in a motel? And, and it was like a, we call them things like a suite or a something or another. And I had about four rooms, three telephones. I thought, this is ridiculous. I had a jacuzzi over there, you know, and things that got bubbles coming up, and you're supposed to get in there. That's all. I can't stand them things. I got in it one time, and it made my back itch. I was like, I ain't fooling. Why would anybody want to do something like that? Uh, it, it's jacuzzi, I know. Uh, but uh, I tell you what. He sat down, and he said, there's a red lobster next door. Hip self, preacher. See? Pretty day. Sunshine. The blessings are come. And then... And these boys going up to Spruce Pine one night to preach. Up almost to Burnsville. And I had a little bitty Volkswagen, one of them old timey kind that had the had the motor in the back, little bitty beetle bugs. And and we went through there. Well, about halfway down the mountain, there was nothing open. It was about 10 o'clock at night. There was not a store, nowhere, nothing. The the my foot went to the floor and just it just stopped. I said, Lord have mercy. Uh uh, boys, they won't get no gas. Just idling. Guy, they said the, the, the uh, cable had a cable go back there where the gas feed is, and it broke. We pulled over and side road. It's pitch dark up there in the middle of nowhere. There wasn't no street light. You couldn't see your hand in front of you. And fine, one of them sat around and had a little bit of a, a, a lighter or something. Showed a little light on there. Said it's broke, brother Danny. And there's four of us. We sit around there a minute, and I'm like, I'm kidding to Spanky. I've always got an idea for everything. I said, I know what, let's do. I said, give me your belt. Everybody took off their belt. We hooked this guy's belt to them. Another, next guy's belt to them. Next guy's belt to them. Because you could go back there in the back and move your finger and go, rear, rear, with, a, with a little thing there. And I said, now you're going to tie that belt on that gas feed. And then we're going to run it over top of the car. And I'm going to set this guy right here down. And I said, whenever I say go, you yank it like that. <laughs> we're up in the mountains, brother. I'm talking about, hey, well, there ain't no guardrails. We all got settled down in there that night. And I remember I was sitting there like that. And I said, all right, you ready, brother? And I put it in first gear. And I said, all right, give it. He, we took off down through that. No, no, stop. If I was changing gear like that, let off. We come all the way down Cox's Creek down there to that mountain like that. I, didn't, I thought we was going to get killed. Sure as a world. Those are the good times. Those are the, I went to a church preach one night. I can tell you a hundred stories. This would come on my mind a couple of days ago. I went to a little old country church riding my pony, and there was, it was, I don't mean this bad, but if you ever been to one of them real country churches and, and it seems like everybody in there is just, just a tad off? <laughs> Every one of them! And like the little French fry having a full Happy Meal. And there's all just, <laughs> and I got through preaching. 
I got through preaching what they're doing, and I'm not making fun of them. It was just that way. And they had me come down here and stand like they said, oh, Brother Danny, just stand in front. That's what they used to do in Mount Free. You remember that? I bet you Miss Anna remember that. They'd have you come down front, and everybody would come around and shake your hand, and they'd give you a dollar or something like that. Well, I stood down there, and they said, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to honor God's man, <laughs> Brother Danny. And, I, and people, this is no joke, one at a time started coming up with a safety pin and some little ornament, and they started pinning it on me. There's one. There's one. I felt like an idiot. I said, all these old women, which I just said, I can't. And they, they would, they would they'd come up here and they'd pin a little flower on me or they'd pin a little twig on me. It was all over me. I looked like a Christmas tree when I, when I walked out of there. But then I crossed the hill and go to another church, like where I'm going next week in Florida. And they'll put me in a motel room up on the second floor over the bay there in Fort Myers where you can see the water flowing and get pick me anything I want to eat. That's the ministry. That's the ministry. Amen? We had a woman try to kill us one time. We thought she was going to try to kill us. Girls did anyway. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Them two. <laughs> and one night, she's crazy. It really was crazy. She's a big woman. She hit a cop uptown, Marion. And she'd stand in my parking place before I got to church and, and wait on me. And when Chris and Corey was little, you remember that? When Chris and Corey was little, she went around telling everybody that that was her kids. And she big too, man. I was scared. One night I was at the altar praying like this, and I was praying I felt something slide up under my arm. And I thought, well, somebody give me a prayer request or something. There's about a three-page letter. She said, you need to pay our bills, Danny. And then I thought, oh, Lord. Well, well, one night, one night, we came home, pulled up in my driveway, and the back door was open. Terry said, Daddy, the door's open. I said, well, I don't want to pray. She said, look, Daddy, there was a McDonald's bag laying right there in the yard. And she said, Daddy, she's here. I said, no, she's not. And they called her name. A lot of y'all remember her name. And I said, no, she ain't here. And she said, Daddy, he's in there. She's in the house. She's scared to death. And you know, you start thinking that, I started getting scared. I started thinking, Lord, what if she is in there? I got a butcher knife going on. So we, me and her, she grabbed a hold of my arm, and I got, a, I got a big knife, and we went through the house. <laughs> One room at a time. I mean, this seems stupid now, but you know, it's dark and everything. You get, you, you start thinking, maybe it really is. I opened the closet, and I said, she ain't in there. I looked on the bed, she couldn't get underneath there. I said, you don't have to worry about that. I said, she ain't in that closet. She ain't in there. And I, I said, we finally cleared the next morning. She must have left during the middle of the night because I never did see her. Lord have mercy. I can tell you, listen, them girls over there, the youngest one, when she was about two years old, Corey, she was here last night, she got real sick and got stopped, stopped up in her nose. She couldn't breathe. She could not breathe. And, and mom would always call me. She said, Danny, them girls all right. And I said, Mom, I didn't want to tell her no more than I had to because she'd worry herself to death. I said, well, actually, Corey can't breathe. And she said, son, you're going to have to get some nose drops in her. You're going to have to. And I said, well, I tried and she won't take them. You know, you buy some of that nose spray and try that with a two-year-old. And I said, you're supposed to go out here, suck it up in there. And she would not do it. She went, nah, nah, nah. Like that right there. I said, honey, you can't breathe. Suck some of it. Nah, no. Nah. And I called mom. I said, Mom, she won't tell you. Mom said, Well, son, you're going to have to get some of that stuff in her nose. So I grabbed her and I held her feet up here like this. Her feet was right here and she was upside down. <laughs> and I, I know what else to do. I took that nose spray and I squirted it down in both nose holes. Her just a squalling. You say, Lord, have mercy. That's what, you tell me about it, genius. How do you get yours to take, take, take nose spray when they're two years old? But then we've seen the blessings. Lord, I've seen it's a thick brother. You had to get a C&I dog to get out of there. I've seen people getting saved by the tens, by the twenties. Then I think, and we shouted the victory. We said, glory to God. Boys, you make up your mind. Like he said, there ain't no little churches. God ain't got no little churches. That's like saying a little elephant. Some are bigger than others, but they're all big. 
God don't have no little churches. You make up your mind if God calls you to the backside of Nolly Chucky or wherever that is, or if he takes you to Timbuktu and he puts you in charge of a little group of people, you rear back and give it your best and ride that pony and just keep on going for the glory of God. Amen. I'll never forget that time I told you about going to Robbinsville. And I cried all the way over there. I was hurt. I was hurting. I don't cry. I don't cry a whole lot. Too much. Real easy. I was tore all to pieces. And I got about halfway over there. And I pulled, I had a little Toyota Camry. And I pulled it in this store. And I put my head on the steering wheel. I just started bawling. I said, God, I can't. God, I, I don't know if I can do this. I ain't, I ain't planning on quitting, but God, I can't do this. You're going to have to help me. I made it on over to that church. You know the story. God moved in. 75 people got saved in 21 nights. And they still preachers in the ministry tonight that got saved in that revival. And honestly, people, I won't even go into the bad stuff. The hard, hard times. I'm talking about real hard. Real hard. The danger of the ride. I've seen the wild blue yonder. I've been in New York City, Niagara Falls, Grand Canyon, Hollywood, Empire State Building. We had one of them birthday party on top of Empire State Building. I rode my pony through Myrtle Beach, Daytona Beach, Miami, the Bahamas, Chicago, Dallas, Atlanta, Detroit, all them cities all, all over Canada and Queen Mary and Spruce Goose out there in Los Angeles and San Diego and, and, uh, and Haiti and Cole and Pennsylvania and Ohio and Missouri and Montana and Texas and, and Alabama and Florida, Louisiana, Michigan, Virginia, Indiana, Illinois, and New Mexico, New York, all and just keep right on, riding right on through it. To deliver the mail. One night I was coming back from um, Alabama. We come through Chattanooga late at night. It's about one o'clock in the morning. If you know if you ever been drove through Chattanooga, all them interstates, they all go into one over there, brother. It's eight about eight lanes both direction. One o'clock in the morning, there was people. I was driving a van full of young people, and there's another car behind me, and right in front of me, this this car went sideways and hit that brick wall uh, in there. Well, my instinct is I slammed on the brakes, pulled over in that. It ain't even really emergency rain. It's on the left. You know, there's about this much room. And I, I opened the door and I said, don't y'all get out of this van. Everybody stay here. Truck's just a whizzing by. You can feel the air push that van. So I run back here that, where that guy was like that. And I, uh, I opened the door and I said, are you all right? This guy come out there like a wild Indian. He come out of there and he started when he hit me hard as he could right here. And I, I, grab, I grabbed him like this and said, no, man, there was traffic right here. 75, 80 mile an hour. He was just staggering right in it. And I grabbed him and threw him back over here. I just couldn't stand, to see that, stand there and see that guy get killed. And I threw him back over here like this. And he was fighting me. I said, man, calm down. You're going to die here. Cars just go, shoo. Big old trucks. You know how they do. They'll blow you over. And and one somebody come running out. I said, "Stay in the van." And somebody come running out and finally somebody helped me. About that time, he jumped that cement, that concrete wall, and started going out in traffic on the other side. So I jumped over the wall and I chased him out there and dragged him back over here like this. And somebody come and grabbed him by the neck and held him like that. And I held him like that. And the cops came. That's a ministry. That's the ministry. Little part. I ain't telling you the bad stuff. One little old boy. They said he carried the mail. Carried the mail. Carried the mail. He said he's, he's going around a big canyon and his horse slipped like that and fell down a, a big bank. It broke a horse's leg so he had to shoot it. It broke his legs. He tied that mail around his neck like that and with a broke leg and drug himself up to the top of that bank. That story said that little old fella drug himself nine miles. And he got to the relay station. 
He said he put right up there to the, to the door of that little station. And his lips were black. His hands bleeding. Look at that nail down right there. Boy died right there. That's, oh Lord, that maybe that. If a man can do that to deliver the mail, surely to the Lord, preachers. You can get, quit being so lazy, get on a horse, get busy for God, and ride. Frankie, I'm like, I got a broke leg, you know that, right? Not, not physically. I'm like this. I promised the Lord a long, I promised the Lord a long time ago. I'm going to carry this till I leave this world. And by the grace and goodness of God, I'm going to take it all the way as far as I can go and throw it down one day and say, Lord, here it is. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a battlefield, brother, and not a recreation room. A fight and not a game. So run if you want to. Run if you will. We can here to stay. You know what we need here tonight? Now, I'm not talking about these young preachers. They're, they're too mainly I'm talking to. I'm talking to everybody in here. You know what you need to do when times get hard? You know what you need to do when your wife leaves you? You keep going. Well, so-and-so said you wasn't supposed Well, so-and-so's an idiot. That ain't what the Lord said. Nobody can take you out of the ministry but you. Nothing another person can do to take a man out of the ministry. The only one who can ruin your ministry is you. Nobody else can. You keep going. You keep going. And you keep going. And if you get your head knocked in, you go anyway. And if they don't give you nothing, you go. And if they give you a bunch, you go. And you deliver mail. I want to be able to fall at his feet one day. Come on, girl. I want to be able to fall at the Lord's feet one day and say, Lord, I didn't do too good. Here's a mail. I may come in hobbling, but I'm coming in. I may come in on crutches, but I'm coming in. By the grace of God. Let's stand together with our heads bowed tonight. They're going to sing. Father, we pray in Jesus' name, do something here tonight.